In this episode of Voice of the Sea, we're learning about algae that grows in deep sea environments called mesophotic reefs. We meet up with algae experts, Dr. Allison Sherwood and Dr. Heather Spaulding to learn more about mesophotic reefs and the many exciting discoveries they are making. With algae, when you hear the word, most people think it's like the scum on the side of your fish tank or that gross green stuff floating over the water. But what I'm really interested in is the macroalgae, or in Hawaiian, the limu. All of the big, sexy, juicy, fleshy things that are flowing and attached to the bottom. And we have hundreds and hundreds of species here in Hawaii. And what's exciting about the work that we do is that we're discovering you know, new species all the time. Every time we go down and do a dive down into deeper water or even shallow water, we pick up a new species. We're still in this process of really trying to discover how much algae is here in Hawaii. What is an alga? It's actually kind of a hard question because there are many different answers that you can look at it, whether you define what is a group of species based upon how they're related from an evolutionary perspective, or their compounds that they contain, their polysaccharides, their pigments that they contain, their shape, how they reproduce, all these things we use to determine what is an alga? <laughs> Regardless of how difficult it is to define it, algae are really important ecologically. In Hawaii, algae are viewed in a very good light. Culturally, they're important in hula, they're important in song, they're important for the food. Everyone loves your poke with your ogo in it, and it's fun to go out. I actually love doing research on algae in Hawaii because it's one of the few places you can go to the beach and people know the algae. You know, like, oh, what are you trying to collect? I'm like, oh, I need, I need limu koho. I've used to need limu koho here. And they'd be like, oh yeah, over there, but don't tell anyone. So it's perfect. You know, it's, it's one of the few places that has an appreciation for algae and it's important culturally. It's important ecologically in terms of creating habitat mm -hmm. and as a food source for other organisms. So algae, when they're introduced from other areas, ecologically they can have a negative impact. You know, or a native species, if there's lots of nutrients introduced into the environment, it can take advantage of that and grow fast and cause a bloom. Some places, if I go to like a coral reef conference and I say I study algae, they're like, oh, you know, it's, it's like a, I'm gonna be evil villain of the conference, right? And you know, everyone's like, oh, your algae is destroying our reefs. But in Hawaii, some of the algae, the, the ones that we study in deeper water, they're the foundation of the reef. There's more algal beds and a much higher diversity of algae at these depths than there is coral. We call them mesophotic coral ecosystems. But in truth, the more accurate term would be mesophotic griefs because the, there's more algae than coral in a lot of these places that we go to. So that depth range, which we define from about 30 meters to 150 meters, so that's like 100 feet and a little bit deeper. There's enough light and it's just really hard to get to. It's deeper than what you normally dive to. It's shallower and closer to shore than most submersibles with big boats attached are really comfortable going to. But it turns out, you know, over the last 10 to 15 years, what we found is that that zone is really important and you shouldn't just pass it by. It turns out in Hawaii, it's a very special place because we have gently sloping substrate. So we have some great habitat offshore with clear water that has produced as a result some of the most spectacular mesophotic ecosystems in the world. So to date we've collected mesophotic algae from over 76 sites across the entire Hawaiian archipelago. We've described 14 different dominant communities of macroalgal reefs at mesophotic depths. So the thought was if we can figure out what species are deep, maybe they could be a refugia that could replace shallow water reefs if at some point conditions change and they're able to recover. So that's what we started out with, and that's a great idea. <laughs> However, what we've been finding is that, oh no, it turns out what's deep, it's really special. The light and the temperature and the nutrients are very different conditions, and they're probably not going to reseed or what we're going to find in shallow water. Instead, we need to find where these areas are and kind of sort of protect them and understand their diversity now. Maybe things are more connected than we thought, but just in deeper water. 
And so we're kind of using these reefs as lifeboats to understand diversity and even phylogeography and biogeography in the entire Pacific. These are some of the species that you would typically find in a mesophotic reef. Yeah, and so some of them are not what you would expect. If I was to describe, for instance, a big green algal blade like this, you would think, oh, well, that, that must occur in like shallow water, right. like in an estuary or in a really nutrient-enriched area where there's a lot of runoff. But it turns out these green algal blades commonly occurred in deep water, down to at least 100 meters, typically in the 80 to 90 meter range. And they would form these really cool assemblages with these red algal blades. And some of these green algal blades would be like three feet long. So they were huge. And there are big blooms of them occurring, or at least a high abundance, I should say, of them occurring at depth. And so that's not what we expected at all. It was a big surprise. It looked like Christmas down there. You got these big green blades, you got all these different red blades. And so we described two um, species from the genus Umbra ulva, and then that are more olive green in color, and then two new species from the genus Ulva of these big green blades that occur at depth. So for instance, this one, this one we named Ova Ohiohilulu, and that's given that name to signify how it would flow in the A'au channel. And the A'au channel is a place that's very important with these mesophotic reefs that we have in Hawaii because of the gently sloping substrate. But that, that's not just the greens and the reds. It turns out we have another group of species called Dystromium, and they look like you know brown ear-shaped blades that are growing. They can occur in sand, like this one. It has a little sandy holdfast that's like a root-like system that it attaches in the sand, but it can also grow on walls and hard substrates. So it almost looks like shelf mushrooms, you know, like going and growing all down through the walls, or they can also grow attached to the Leptocerus coral reefs that are down there. In the northwestern Hawaiian islands, we see a lot of big beds of this net light green alga called microdictyon. And in the main Hawaiian islands, we also have microdictyon beds, but it's a whole different species and it grows very different. Some algae can be calcified, so they have calcium carbonate in them the same way that corals do. And so algae such as Halamita form calcified green algal beds. You feel how it's kind of hard? Crunchy. Yeah, it's like hard and crunchy. Palomita, when it dies, guess what it makes? Sand. That's right. <laughs> and does the sand that it's make stay down at depth or does some of that sand come up to shore and form our beaches? Well, um, in Hawaii, we have species like Halamita discoidea, which actually we find shallow and we find deep, but it can be very abundant in shallow water. And in some places in Hawaii, like in Kailua, up to 40% of the sand can be made from Halamita discoidea. Some of these species that are very important, like culturally and I think ecologically are disappearing and we don't know necessarily know why. So that mm -hmm. makes us want to go through and describe a lot of these other species as fast as we can because we're just really starting to understand some of these mesophotic environments much less the shallow water environment. There's an urgency I feel like to trying to get to these places and describe these species. University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program. Helping coastal communities of Hawaii and the Pacific. Through research, education, and outreach. Serving the community, from elementary to graduate students. Hawaii Sea Grant. Welcome back. To Voice of the Sea. We're in the Plant Science Lab at UH Manoa with Dr. Allison Sherwood, learning about how she identifies different types of algae and the process of classifying and describing a new species. We've been working here at the University of Hawaii for about 15 years, and what we're trying to do is characterize the seaweeds of the Hawaiian Islands. We want to know how many different species we have, whether or not they have names, and if they don't, to give them the names that they deserve, and then to figure out their evolutionary affinities, so what they're related to. Are there species out there that are in other Pacific Islands or in other continental areas that they match or that they seem to have evolved from? And what makes Hawaii a special place for you to study algae? 
like, oh, why special in so many ways? Well, we're isolated out here. And that's interesting for the seaweeds and the algae because they are also isolated. So they're on these really unique evolutionary trajectories. We've ended up with uh, a stunning array of species that just aren't found anywhere else in the world. Do we want to take a look at one of your projects? Sure, yeah, <laughs> I'd be happy to do that. Genus Martensia, so this is a, a red alga. It's an alga that's found pretty commonly around the main Hawaiian Islands as well as the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And we have specimens that we've collected over the last 15 years from the shallow water areas here in the Hawaiian Islands that we are comparing to these deeper water ones that we have now. So the first thing we do is DNA extraction, PCR, and DNA sequencing to get our, our sequence information about all these different specimens that we're working with. And once we can compare our specimens with the DNA sequences, then we know how to start grouping these together into things that might be species. So then we would take a, a pile of specimens that we think are probably a species based on DNA sequence to the microscope and start to look at the characters that we need to see there. And if these characters also make sense in terms of describing a species or belonging to what we might assume to be a species level unit, then we would proceed with acknowledging that as yes, that's a species unit, something that needs to be described or given a name. So what we're looking at here are actually two specimens of the same species. Oh. Yeah, if you were just going to identify these based on the morphology, it might be a little confusing because they actually look pretty different from each other. They're different sizes, they're slightly different colors, and you can see some of these have these really elongated network regions, like this one is a gigantic one. These ones are much smaller mm -hmm. in size. So there is a lot of variability in the morphology, and that's one of our biggest challenges in studying seaweeds and algae. I think it's important that we understand the, the real diversity that's out there for a couple of reasons. For one, just to have a better sense of global biodiversity, if we want to enumerate the species on Earth, it's important that we're recognizing these distinctions. But also, probably more importantly, you can't move on and understand anything about the ecology of an ecosystem if you don't know how many entities you're working with or what they are. Here at the microscope, what we typically do is make some preparations from the herbarium sheets or for some other material that we've collected and maybe kept in formalin or you know some sort of fixative so we can look at the sample again. And then what we need to do is get it onto the slide and then we're using the microscope and usually taking images to understand what the, the morphology and the anatomy of the specimens are at that point. So for Martensia, what I've been really focusing on are the things that I'm seeing that people have been using for the last couple of hundred years to describe species. So we have images where we're looking at, for example, the, the surface cells, and we need to get an understanding of how large they are, the shape they are, and then the internal structures inside of them, the chloroplasts, how many of those you might see, and whether they're at the periphery or, or more distributed through the cells. Uh, we're looking at the reproductive structures, so there's some female structures that are produced, and they have a series of spores as the next generation after fertilization and so we're looking at the overall size of these structures and the shape of the spores that come out. For Martensia you saw that it had this network towards the top of the plant. If you look at the the periphery of that network under the microscope what you see are these little extensions sometimes. So some of the species have these little finger-like things that are growing out of the edge of the network. And those can be diagnostic for species, and then other species have a more flattened peripheral edge on them where there's nothing decorating it. But probably the most important characters from Martensia are in that network itself. And you can see it here. It's just this strand of cells that are going up and down, connecting that periphery to the, the main part of the plant at the bottom. And so what people are using to describe these different species are how thick these different strands are, whether they have these extra little pokey ones that stick mm -hmm. up or down, and the tendency for that, and which direction they go. So they get very detailed in, in the, just what this plant is made of and how it's put together also the development of it. So we look for the early formation of the nets and study the anatomy of how it develops in those earliest stages of network production. There's a whole invisible world at the microscopic <laughs> level that we rely on really heavily to tell these species apart. But it's also, to me, it's what got me into studying algae in the first place. It's just the beauty of these organisms when you start to look at them under the light microscope. All of a sudden, there's this amazing, beautiful world that opens up. This is one of the most time-consuming parts of doing the project. For this Martensia project that we've been working on, making the slides, just getting the microscope slides together probably took 
one to two weeks. Then you move to the microscope and start looking at the features that you need and trying to get the exact perfect shot that you need to go ahead and assemble your plate of images into the journal article where you're going to be describing your new species. All told, it probably spent at least three weeks of time on the microscope for that particular project which might sound sort of reasonable for one paper, one series of descriptions for a genus, but when you try to amplify that out for the number of things that we really have to work on in the mesophotic flora, we're looking at probably years of time, many years of time altogether at the microscope to get all the information that we're going to need to fully understand that flora. Once we have all that, we'll be able to move on and start to look at things like these issues of connectivity, where the deep reefs similar or different from what we're seeing in the shallow regions? Are the things that we're seeing in the mesophotic reefs unique? Are they endemic to here? How does that change with latitude? And what are the biogeographical affinities to other areas of the world? We are looking for a few heroes, mentors, trailblazers, innovators a passion to change lives, spark curiosity, open hearts, and awaken minds, help students answer the question, who am I? This could be your calling, but this is no job. It's the journey of a lifetime. Be a hero. Be a teacher. Welcome back to Voice of the Sea. We're in Dr. Allison Sherwood's lab where we take a quick dive into the methods researchers use to investigate the genetics of deep sea algae. If I'm studying um, sea urchins and I take off a little tube feet off a sea urchin or a fin clip off a fish, I can grind that up and I can guarantee you with almost 100% certainty, I'm gonna get good DNA from that. If I do the same thing with the algae, hmm, <laughs> it's, maybe I will. You go to the psychology conference and everyone's like, Psst, hey, I'm trying to get DNA from this. And they're like, oh yeah, I use this with this add-on, with this special technique, with this special kit. Why don't you try this? You have all these different techniques that you use to get DNA from old presses, like presses from herbaria that are like 100 years old. So you have special techniques for that. And so we'll use that. And then you have special techniques for every algal group. Extracting DNA from algae is tricky. How you would extract DNA from the red algae, like the bedrag algae, blades can be different than how I would extract it from a green blade and definitely different than how I would extract it from the, the brown algal blade. Well first you just try it regular <laughs> and then if it doesn't work then you start going into the special technique toolkit to try and see if you can just get DNA out of it. The best luck I've had is freezing things at negative 80 but when you're out on a research vessel we often don't have a negative 80 freezer, so you gotta get, you gotta preserve it in different ways. But what we um, can use is like salt mixtures, mm -hmm. so like DMSO. We can try their alcohol methods. Someone shipped me some samples in rum, and it worked really, it worked really well. Yeah, so there are different ways that you can preserve the algae to get the DNA out, but the traditional method, to be honest, what we typically do is just save it in cat litter. So it turns out silica gel, which is like your basic cat litter, does a really good job, typically, of preserving algae. So our backup, like no matter what, we save it in silica gel, and then if that doesn't work, then we move on to the other techniques of trying to preserve them in different special ways. This is absolutely a collaborative effort. And so what we do is kind of partition the projects based on who's interested in what. So our entire team, well, I'm part of it, but in addition to that, we also have a postdoctoral fellow. Usually one to two graduate students are working on the project as well. And currently right now, three undergraduates as well who are all undertaking individual projects looking at either species or genera of these mesophotic algae. This is Becca Katz, and Becca is an undergraduate student, and she's working on a research experience with us in the lab this summer. Uh, Becca's studying the green algal genus Calerpa, and what she's doing right now is preparing a, an agarose gel, which she's going to run 
with the process called electrophoresis. And what this allows her to do is see whether her amplification of a particular gene was successful or not. And this is how we test out whether this first step worked before we send our products on for DNA sequencing. What she's going to do is take this agarose gel that she has poured into this plastic mold. It goes into this chamber that's right there to the left and that has a buffer in it. And then what she's going to do is load her products from the polymerase chain reaction, or the PCR, into these little wells. They apply a current to the box, and that separates out these products based on their size. So this is the box where we have the gel loaded. The samples are in the gel. The gel is in the buffer. The buffer is in the chamber. And what we're going to do now is run an electric current through that buffer in the chamber. And what we can do is run a standard next to that, which tells us how large our fragments are. And from that, we can see whether or not the reaction was successful. This is Monica Payano. Monica is a postdoctoral fellow working on the project. And what she's doing is purifying some sample. And she's determined through electrophoresis that her products were successful. So now she's removing all the bits of things that we put in the initial reaction that we no longer need. And they might inhibit the process of DNA sequencing. So we have to take out all the extra bits. And and then this is Charles Hambly. Charles is uh, with us this summer from the University of Guam, and he's participating in a, a research experience here for the entire summer. Charles is working on diversity of the red algal genus Gracilaria from our mesophotic samples. So the last step before we send them on is to prepare the smaller aliquots of material that are going to be taken over to the sequencing facility for them to do the actual sequencing. So once we've sent our samples off for DNA sequencing and they've been run by the facility, they're going to mail our sequence data back to us. And so this is Fereza Cabrera. She's a second year master's student in the lab and she's studying the diversity of the, the mesophotic red blade samples that we have. And so Fereza is bringing up some of the DNA sequence data that she's gotten back recently. And what she can see in this DNA sequence analysis program is um, how successful the sequencing was. And she can also read those individual A, C, Ts, and Gs that are part of her DNA sequence. And once that's edited, she can then compare her different sequences for her different samples to get a sense of the diversity that we have. There's a little spot there on the bottom where we're seeing an overlap in a couple of different peaks. But by and large, the peaks are quite distinct and they're they're decently clear, I'd say, from each other. So we would use most of that DNA sequence. Next, we check out the algae specimens at the Bishop Museum with collections manager, Barbara Kennedy. I have a really interesting job. It's really fun. Most of the time it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> so Barb, can you first tell me a bit about where we are right now? We're in a herbarium. And so a herbarium is a collection of plant specimens that have been dried and pressed. And then you store them in a fashion so that you can retrieve what you're looking for. Bishop Museum maintains and keeps inventories of all the plants and animals in Hawaii, including algae. <laughs> we have over 750,000 records here. We are the state repository, the largest Hawaiian collection in the world. And then from there, our focus is Polynesia, Micronesia, and Melanesia. Our oldest records from Hawaii date back to Captain Cook's third voyage. This is our, what we call the types room, and it houses all of our type specimens. The specimens are housed in cabinets organized alphabetically by plant family. So right here is where we keep all of the Hawaiian limu. Let's find one. This should be pretty cool. Ooh, boxes. Yep. Sometimes it's too 3D. You can't smash it. And this is a holotype. So they're like, they're your most important type collections. Uh, the holotype is the specimen they use to describe in the journal. There's different ways to organize a herbarium. Our way is really user friendly. It's alphabetical by plant family and then by genus and species. Some herbaria do it more by phylogenetics or the relationship of plants. Watch more episodes and find additional content online at voiceofthesea.org. Follow us on social media at Voice of the Sea TV. Mahalo for watching Voice of the Sea.